So we open our heart this morning and ask that you would just minister your life through the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we love the book of Hebrews. This is like one of the most important books because it reveals Jesus to us like no other book in the Bible. And it, like the title suggests, it is written to Jews, Hebrews, um, and of course, Jews who believe in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And they are in Jerusalem. Now, when you think about, hey, Jerusalem, that, that's like the birthplace of Christianity. That means, that means like that church has got to be the oldest of all the churches. Therefore, I think a lot of people, you know, we can make the assumption since it's the oldest church, well, it ought to be like the most mature church, right? That's actually not the case at all. It's actually a church in trouble. And the reason it's in trouble, they're in Jerusalem they have all this pressure from the Jews to go back, back to Judaism, back to the ways of the Old Testament, back to the laws of Moses, back to the shadow of the thing, the reality, the substance is in Christ. And so there's that call out. He writes to them. He wants them to hold strong on their faith, hold firm, do not drift away from this. Do you realize what great salvation we have in Jesus Christ. And so he writes to reveal Christ beautifully, powerfully to them. In fact, he writes from the very, very beginning. He just, I mean, he just knocks it out of the park, starting in verse 1 of chapter 1, where he says, In the former days, God spoke to the fathers through the prophets in many portions and in many ways. But in these last days... God speaks to us through his son. He speaks his heart. He is the radiance of God's glory. He is the exact representation of his nature. But see, this is so important. God sent his son not just to give us an education. God sent his son to reconcile the world to himself, to seek and to save that which was lost. God sent his son to go and get you and to bring you home that you might have a relationship to God as your father. It's very, very personal when you really see that this is so much more than an education. God wants to get a hold of our lives. So he's writing here to challenge them, to grow in their faith, to grow deeper. See, he says, hey, by this time, you ought to be teachers of spiritual things. But no, you need someone to teach you. Again, the elementary, literally the alpha, beta, gamma, the ABCs of spiritual things. In other words, you come to need milk and not solid food. Now, he challenges them and we need to see it as a challenge to us as well. Why is it that some people don't grow in their faith? Why is it that some people don't increase in spiritual maturity? Well, Jesus gives a parable that I think gives a, some insight. He said, the word of God that is sown is like a farmer that is sowing seed. And like there are different types of soil that the seed may fall upon, there are different kinds of hearts. And one of those he describes where someone hears the word, they receive the word, and at first, you know, you begin to see some sprouting forth but then the worries of the world, the deceitfulness of riches, the desires for other things, they come in and they choke the word and it bears no fruit. It, it produces nothing in their lives. So he writes to them and tells them, you need to go stronger in your faith. Do you realize what great salvation that we have? Do not neglect so great a salvation. God has poured out his heart to reconcile the world, to give us a relationship. We must be careful to not neglect so great a uh, salvation. Hey, if God sent his son, we need to receive him and we need to receive everything he has for us in Christ. God's heart is to bless us. God's heart is to bring us into deeper faith, greater maturity. And you really see in these verses that we're looking at today, chapter 5, we begin in verse 9. And having been made perfect, he became to all those who obey him the source of eternal salvation, speaking of Christ, being designated by God as a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. 
that did you know that Jesus was a high priest and that he's a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek? What does this mean? This is really very fascinating. The, he goes on in verse 11. Now, concerning him, we have much to say, but it's hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. What's the opposite of dull of hearing? Sharp of hearing. Eager to hear. Ears that are attuned and longing to hear. He says, verse 12, Hey, by this time you ought to be teachers, but you have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles, the ABCs of the oracles of God, and you've come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is not accustomed to the word of righteousness. He is a babe. But solid food is for the mature who, because of practice, have their senses trained to discern good and evil. Chapter 6, verse 1. Therefore, leaving the elementary teaching about the Messiah, the Christ, let us press on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and a faith of God. All right, these are a call out. This is a really great verses. And the point that he's making from the very beginning there is that we should desire spiritual maturity. He's showing us Jesus. He's showing us Jesus like in no other place. Oh, what a great salvation we have. He gives us some of the richest, deepest understandings. And he says, Jesus is our high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. Now, what in the world does that mean? And why is it important? See, this is an example of deeper truths. In fact, he says, concerning him, we have much to say. But it's hard to explain because they become dull of hearing. And it's a call out for us to become eager to hear, to long for some deeper things. Because what he's telling us here is very significant. See, when he brings up Melchizedek, it brings us back to the days of Abraham. In days of Abraham, there was a man who was king and priest. Very rare that someone would be king and priest. And his point, of course, is that Jesus is, in fact, the king, and he is the priest, the high priest. This man, Melchizedek, was king and priest of Salem, the city that we know today as Jerusalem. And he was greater than Abraham. Now see, the, the Jewish understanding was, Abraham is our father. Abraham was the great one, great father Abraham. Now, all, I'd say, the major religions of the world today trace their roots to Abraham. Christianity does, Judaism does, and Islam. All trace their history and their roots to Abraham, the great father Abraham. And the point that he's making is, yeah, you, you look back to your great father Abraham, and he was a great father. But Jesus is greater than Abraham. Because Melchizedek, in those days, he says, Abraham paid tithes unto Melchizedek, and as a priest, he prayed over and blessed Abraham. And therefore, Melchizedek, Jesus, in the order of Melchizedek, is greater than Abraham and all the Levitical priests that came after him. In fact, Jesus is greater than Jonah. Jesus is greater than Solomon. Jesus is greater than Abraham. Jesus is greater than the temple itself. You say, well, how do you know that, Pastor from the words of Jesus himself. Notice, for example, in John chapter 8, verses 57 and 58, Jesus is having a conversation. Well, actually, it was a confrontation with the Jewish leaders. And at one point, he said, Abraham saw my day, and he rejoiced in it. And uh, so they respond, you are not even 50 years old, and you have seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was born, I am. This was a shocking statement. It was like a wave of shock went right through them. What is the name of God? The name of God is Jehovah or Yahweh. What does it mean? It means I am. So when Jesus said, I tell you truly, before Abraham was born, I am. Whoosh, a big wave of shock. So shocking. They took up rocks to stone him. Jesus is greater than Abraham. 
Jesus is greater than the temple. Notice in Matthew 12, verse 6, I say to you, Jesus says, something greater than the temple is here. And then in Matthew 12, verse 41, he's correcting them. He said, now listen, the men of Nineveh, they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, something greater than Jonah is here. Matthew 12, 42, correcting them. The queen of the south, she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, something greater than Solomon is here. So there's the great salvation because God has sent forth the only begotten Son. See, there's much to say, but we must be careful to hear, long for it, because, this is the point, God expects you to grow in your faith. See, verse 12. Hey, by this time, you ought to be teachers, he said, but you've come to need milk and not solid food. Now, let's not criticize the milk because milk is really a very important thing. For a new believer, a young person in their faith, milk is essential. Milk is great. The elementary things. I mean, you would never go up to the first grade class upstairs and teach them about Jesus being a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. You teach them the elementary things, the basic, the ABCs. Just like, you know, the, 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 the baby is nourished on the milk of the word. See, like 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2, like newborn babies, he says, long for the pure milk of the word so that by it you may grow in respect to salvation. See, notice that emphasis on longing. Like a baby, they, they want their milk, they cry for the milk, they long for it. There's a hunger, there's a thirst. See, th that's right. When a Christian is longing for it, you love to see young Christians that are like excited, you know, they're longing, they want to grow, they want to understand this. And it's a wonderful thing to see young believers growing. God is delighting to see it. You know, and now we understand how important it is to, to really receive that which is nourishing to the soul that we might grow. See, now that we have a, uh, adopted our granddaughter, we are emphasizing the importance of school. Uh, you know, I, I wish that when I was young, someone would just really convince me how important school is. Now that I'm older, I know how important it is. So we speak to our granddaughter, oh, you need to get that school, you know. You need to press in because it's going to help you. You're going to grow. See, we expect all fathers... All mothers, they want their children to grow. God's the same way. And when you see them growing, oh, what a delight it is to the soul. You know, uh, Via, when she first came to live with us, many of you know our story. Our daughter was tragically killed two summers ago. And so we brought in our granddaughter and adopted her. And when she first came to live with us, she was seven and she was into dolls. Uh, that was, you know, the, the stage of her life. And she was into these dolls, and uh, particularly Barbie dolls. And uh, so one day she said, Grandpa, would you play dolls with me? And I said, being the strong, self-assured person that I am, yes, I'll play dolls with you. And so I sat down and uh, I said, here's the rules. First of all, I will not be a girl doll, okay? <laughs> and secondly, there will be no boy-girl drama in this game that we play, Okay. She says, okay, well, if you're going to be a guy doll, then I will be a guy doll. I said, well, great. So I picked a guy doll, someone young and dashing. And so she picked a guy doll, right? And so we're here, we're having our guy doll conversation. So I start the conversation. Hey, dude, dude, listen, I heard something amazing today. Her doll says, really? What did you hear? I heard that if we do really, really great at our school, that we can get a scholarship to college. You know, really? What is that? Oh, that's where you get really good grades and they pay your way to go to college. Isn't that amazing? Now, about this time, our youngest daughter happened to come in the room and saw me there on the floor. And she says, Dad, are you playing Barbie dolls? To which I said, yes, I am. You have to say it very confidently. Well, a couple of days later, I come into Avia's room and she's playing with her dolls and she's got these two girl dolls, right? And I said, oh, what are you doing? So oh, we're having a conversation. I said, really, what about? Oh, we're talking about getting scholarships. <laughs> I go, yeah, that's great. She says, yeah, we're going to get all the scholarships so the boys don't get any. I go, yeah, <laughs> that's my girl right there. See, 
And, and now, you know, she, two years later, she's not into the dolls anymore. Now she's into do-it-yourself projects and making YouTube videos, you know. But you see her growing. She's memorizing Ephesians 6. You see her increasing in spiritual things, growing. What a delight to see. God delights in it. If she just continues to grow, can you just imagine? See, I love 1 Corinthians 13, 11. When I was a child, I used to speak like a child, think like a child, reason like a child. But when I became a man, I did away with childish things. And there's that expectation that God has for us. He's calling us to grow. It's very, very important. But here's something we need to see. Age alone does not produce maturity. See, when you think of maturity, we commonly think of age, assuming that people, as they grow older, they are also growing in maturity. But that is not always the case. For example, time alone does not heal a person of a hot temper. It's going to take something else besides time. Time alone does not heal a catty tongue or an unforgiving heart. It's going to take something else. Time alone does not heal a bossy attitude or a bitter spirit. Something else has to happen. However, it's quite possible to be young and quite mature in your faith. Timothy is a great example. Very young. Paul took him under his wing, mentored him, taught him, and he was entrusted with great responsibility even though he was young. See, he writes to Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 11 and 12. He writes, prescribe and teach these things. Let no one look down on your youthfulness, but rather in your speech, your conduct, your love, your faith, and your purity, show yourself to be an example of those who believe. What does it take to grow spiritually? How does a person move from immaturity to maturity? It has everything to do with your desire to grow, that you hunger for it, you thirst for it, you want the things of God. And that makes you teachable. So you, you, you soak in, you have ears that are sharp, you are tuned to the things because you want to know them. But it's not just an education that you want. You don't want just to learn you want the changes of life that come from it. Spiritual maturity brings transformation in the character, in the living, and that's what you want because it's much better. See, we can edu by education we can say, hey, a forgiving heart is better than a bitter heart. We can check that off on our knowledge base. Well, which one is better? Let's see, a forgiving heart or a bitter heart? Well, I... I would assess and discern that a forgiving heart is better. I know that now. Check. No, I want to have it. If a forgiving heart is better than a bitter heart, then I want it. I want that heart. Ah, that's a whole nother level. That's a whole different thing. Being gentle and kind is better than being cantankerous and rude. Well, then I want to be gentle and kind. I don't want to just check that off my knowledge base. Faith is better than fear. I don't want to be a prisoner held in bondage by fear. I want the freedom that comes, the strength that comes from a, a faith that's growing in depth. Trusting in God is better than becoming easily offended. Well, then I want to trust God and his perspective for my life. Having a thankful heart is better than having a complaining heart. Well, I want that then. That's the kind of heart I want. See, he's telling us Something very key. Notice in chapter 6, verse 1, he says, press on to maturity. Press. Move on. He says, leave the elementary things. Press on. Move into deeper things. Deeper faith brings deeper living. Confidence in, in Christ. Strength of faith. But you must press on to obtain it. How does that happen? Well, I, I think the uh, picture of food is a good one. A baby longing for the pure milk takes in that milk and that milk strengthens the baby. And then as that baby grows, then that baby can start to handle soft foods 
more complicated, softer foods. But that softer food strengthens the baby. And then that baby continues to grow. And then they go moving into vegetables and the meat of things. And they become strong and vibrant. And they're growing and they're healthy. It's a great picture. Good analogy. Have you ever met anyone uh, that refuses to eat vegetables? I, I, over the years, I've known several people who absolutely will not eat vegetables. Their diet consists of Doritos, uh, Cheetos, French fries, and to balance it out, Diet Pepsi. And this is their diet. Ever met someone like this? And of course, we know the implication, of course, what that does to the body. You know, when I was young, I used to, of course, not eat so well back in those days, and I used to be addicted to ding-dongs. You know what ding-dongs are? Ding-dongs are amazing. I think they still have them. Uh, they are like, they look like hockey pucks, but they're chocolate cake, and they've got some kind of ooey-gooey something white in the middle, and it's covered with a, like a firm chocolate frosting. Oh, they are addicting. Ding-dongs, anybody know what ding-dongs are? Yeah. They are awesome. By the way, a, a few years ago, I mentioned ding-dongs, and someone went out and bought me some. I am not addicted to ding-dongs. Do not buy me ding-dongs, okay? But they, I, when I was young, I did. They were awesome. But see, the spiritual application is really, really relevant. Because we know you put those kinds of things in your body, we know the end result's not good. The same is true spiritually. There are a lot of spiritual ding-dongs out there. Is that not true? Well, a lot of spiritual ding-dongs. There's a lot of spiritual things that are so bad for the soul. So when you bring in things to the soul that are, are strengthening, healthy, vibrant, they add to you, that's how you grow. See, that's why he says in, in chapter 5, verse 13, he's telling us to become accustomed to the Word. He says, everyone who partakes only of milk is not accustomed to to the word of righteousness. He's a babe. The word he's not accustomed is unskilled, inexperienced. See, God uses the word of God. The word of God is used of the Lord in our lives. It's very, very important to understand that. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. All scripture is inspired. That means breathed by God. And it is profitable for teaching, for reproof in our lives, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. It's very, very important. God uses the word, is breathed by God. It's living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. It's sent with power. It's anointed by the Lord. And he wants us to become skilled and experienced and accustomed to the word. A few years ago, my wife, <clears throat> for Father's Day, gave me a gift. It was a book, and it was called The Complete Gentleman. I'm sure she wasn't hinting. It was a, it was a history book, and she knows I like history. And it, it traces back the history of being a gentleman all the way back from days of knights and, you know, knighthood and valor and all that, all through the modern age. And I'm reading this book. It's really interesting. But one, one concept, one idea just grabbed me. It said, a gentleman masters whatever he does. And I, I thought, oh, that's intriguing. A gentleman masters whatever he does. And he goes on to explain that in those days, a, uh, a gentleman would have to carry a sword with him at all times. Very dangerous times. You never know when you would be called upon to defend your family, defend your wife or whatever. So you always had this sword. Now, if you're going to carry a sword, you better know how to use a sword. And so they would practice in the evening. The men would get together and they would start to refine their skills and hone their ability to, 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 to sword fight. Because if you're going to carry a sword, you better know how to use a sword. You better become accustomed to the sword. You better become skilled in the sword. Now, right away, I saw the spiritual implications. The word of the, of, of the God, the word of the Lord is the sword of the spirit. And so he's telling us to become accustomed to become skilled, experienced. 2 Timothy 2.15 Be diligent to present yourself approved by God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handling the word of truth. May I suggest to you, if you want to become accustomed to the word, 
One of the places to do that is at our Wednesday service. I think Wednesday service is one of the most important things we do. Because it's that verse by verse by verse, getting into the, the meat, the vegetables, you might say, of the good word, that we can become accustomed and skilled at living it and applying it to our lives. Because we're living in days where that's becoming a necessity. You look at what's happening in the world today. We need to become experienced and accustomed, especially to the prophetic word, that we might discern the signs of the times. Jesus told us it's essential, it's important. For example, look at Matthew 16, <clears throat> verses 2 and 3. Jesus replied to them, when, you, when it is evening, you say, it will be fair weather, for the sky is red. <clears throat> and in the morning, you say, uh, there will be a storm today, for the sky is red and threatening. Do you know how to discern the appearance of the sky, but you cannot discern the signs of the times? Which is to say, you must it's important, especially as we get nearer and nearer those last days. It's critical that we can discern what's happening in the world scene. Matthew gave, uh, Jesus gave us the signs of the time in Matthew 24 and 25 that we might be on the alert. We might be watchful. We might prepare our lives spiritually and be ready. He brought out Daniel, the prophecies there. There's, of course, Revelation, Zechariah, Ezekiel. These are critical in our understanding because we are seeing the landscape of the world, nations, changing before our eyes. There is a, there's a new world order that is unfolding now. It's very, very critical and important to understand. This last week, uh, Matthew and I had the, the privilege and honor of hosting the Georgine Rice radio program on KBDQ. And I used the opportunity to bring current events that we're seeing around the world in the news to, to lace them with the scriptures that apply because there is so much that we have to understand when you look at what's happening in the world. It's very important. You look at this election. This is the most messed up election I have ever seen in my life. You have to say, well, why? Why is this such a messed up election? I suggest to you it's a messed up election because we're living in messed up country, in a messed up world, and it's a reflection of what's going on in this nation, and it's a reflection of what's going on in this world. And I suggest to you that this, this has prophetic significance. And then you look at what's happening in Europe. The landscape and the fabric of Europe is changing before our eyes. Then you look at Russia's growing presence in Syria. And the insistence that they have to take control of that area of the world. Then you look at the growing alliance between Russia and China. Can you just imagine the size of the army when those two massive armies are combined together? See, the scripture tells us that there will be a massive army such that this world has never seen that will come from the north through Syria. And it will attack Israel in the valley of Megiddo, the famous uh, battle of Armageddon. And you see what's happening now. You see that these things are the unfolding of, of, of prophecy before our eyes. And then you see what's happening in Europe right now. For the first time in the history of the world, there is a mayor of a major European city who is also a Muslim. And it is the beginning of a tremendous trend because we're seeing now as the millions of refugees from Syria are now moving into the greater part of Europe, you can see now a growing influence as the fabric of Europe, mainland Europe, is now being changed, the influence of Islam growing in intensity. In fact, the scripture tells us that the Antichrist will come out of a ten-nation alliance out of Europe. And very likely, because this Antichrist will be able to bring the Arab nations into a peace treaty with Israel, that he will very likely be Muslim in his faith. And we say, well, how can you have a Muslim leader come out of Europe? Well, now we begin to see. And so the fabric of Europe is changing and prophecy is unfolding. You see Iran getting nearer and nearer to having the capability of a nuclear weapon. And then there's Brexit. And you see all of these things that are changing on the world landscape. And you see there's a necessity. The world order is changing. 
prophetic significance to what is happening it creates in us a sense of urgency that we must discern the signs of the times. And then he moves on to tell us that we must train our senses to discern. Notice uh, verse 14. Solid food is for the mature who, notice this phrase, because of practice have their senses trained to discern. See, because they're growing accustomed to the word, because solid food of God's word is being put into practice, their, their senses are being trained to discern. Uh, like Job 34, 3, the ear tests words like the palate tastes food. The scripture tells us that spiritual maturity brings the response where the ear is testing the words. See, instead of becoming dull of hearing, you listen carefully to discern. The biblical word applied to what's happening in the world, what's happening in life. You're discerning that which is false because the more you know of the truth, the more you will be able to discern. Know the truth, know the truth, understand, get accustomed to the word, because as you know the truth, you can discern that which is false. Here's a, here's a, a funny illustration that's kind of telling on myself a bit, but when uh, a few years ago, my wife and I, we got a, uh, a gift. It was um, some tickets to the singing Christmas tree downtown. So we went, and it was a great concert, and it was very dark in there, and at one point, there was some big dynamic thing going on, and everybody stood on their feet. So I took the opportunity to put my arm around my wife, and I took hold of the back of her arm, which is okay. I'm married. It's all right. So I put my arm, and I'm holding on to the back of her arm, and all of a sudden, I, I say to myself, wow, she has a very muscular arm. <laughs> what triceps? Like, wow. And then deep spiritual discernment kicked in right away. It's like, oh, that's not her arm. That's the arm of the guy standing next to her who then looked at me like, mm hmm <laughs> See, but notice this phrase. He said, because of practice, they have their senses trained. They apply. They live. Jesus says, it's he who hears my word and lives according to them. He is the wise man who is building his life on a rock, a foundation. And then the storms will not destroy it. You're growing, you're grasping because you're putting it into life. May I suggest to you also that spiritual maturity is not just for you. It's not just for you. It's to bless those that are around you. It's to help those that are broken. There is so many broken people today. There are so many hurting broken people. And there's a necessity of those who are growing in spiritual things so they can help. They can minister. you got something to say. You know, it reminds me of that when you go on an airplane, you fly, you know, they give you that little pre-flight speech. Uh, should there be an emergency and a loss of cabin pressure, you know, these oxygen masks will fall. Make sure that you put it on yourself first before you help anyone else. So this is a great spiritual application. Make sure that you take the Word of God and you put it on yourself. Make sure you take the Word of God and you put it on your life. And you grow in it. And you grow in strength from it. But then it's not just for you. Strengthen your brother. Strengthen. Encourage. If you've been through it, if you've been through a storm, you got, and you know that God is faithful. You've seen his faithfulness. You've got something to say. It's oftentimes we, we ask believers who've had alcoholism in their life. But they know the victory of Christ. They got something to say to those who are still in it. It's oftentimes those who are struggling with drugs and drug addiction, but who've seen the victory that comes through the spiritual life of God within them that can help other people. They got something to say. It's like we lost our daughter tragically two, two summers ago. We have something to say to those who've lost a child. We understand the pain. We know the faithfulness of God. It's not just for you. God wants us to move beyond the elementary things and grow in spiritual things. Immaturity is very costly. It brings great harm, great destruction. But there is great treasure 
in the wisdom and the knowledge of godly things. Desire it. Want it. It's what you thirst for. It's what you long for. Want the changes of my life that come from it. Let's pray. Lord, we are so thankful because your word speaks right to where we are. And I pray for everyone in this room today. Lord, help us to all respond to your word. And church, would you even say to the Lord today, I want the transformation. I want the things in my life that come from spiritual maturity. I want the changes. I want the faith. God, I want to make a difference. I want some meaning and significance in this life. And I know it comes from the maturity that comes through you. I want that. It's my hunger. It's my thirst. It's what I'm asking for. Church, is that your heart? Would you say that to the Lord? That is what I'm asking for, Lord. I want that. I want that change in my life. I want those things that come from maturity. I want those things. I hunger. I thirst. I want those things that you have for me. Would you just raise your hand and say that to the Lord? I want those things. I want those changes. I'm asking. I'm hungry. I'm thirsty. My ears are attuned. God, I ask that you move on me and move upon my spirit. Thank you, O Lord, for everyone who has touched of the Lord today. We bless you and we honor you for what you're doing in our lives. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen. Let's give the Lord praise, glory, and honor. Amen. Amen. Let's let's all stand to our feet. Let's enter in. We've set aside this time to draw near. Let's draw near to the Lord as we worship Him.